Chapter 12, Part 2 of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Limebrook of Lake Elsinore, California. Chapter 12, Part 2 Second Invasion of Maryland, Gettysburg. Buford's Division Opens the Fight at Gettysburg. Death of General Reynolds. First Day's Repulse. Second Day. Rebel Advantages. Third Day. Last Grand Effort. Death of General Farnsworth. The Republic Just Saved. First Day at Gettysburg. General Buford, with his division, had moved from Frederick City directly to Gettysburg, the capital of Adams County, a rural village of about 3,000 inhabitants, beautifully situated among the hills, which, though quite lofty, are generally well cultivated. The general found the borough very quiet, and passed through, but he had not proceeded far beyond before he met the van of the rebel army under General Heath of Hill's Corps. The dauntless troopers charged furiously the invading hordes, and drove them back upon their supports, where our boys were driven back in their turn before overwhelming numbers. As Providence would have it, our infantry advance, under General James S. Wadsworth, marching from the village of Emmitsburg, hearing the familiar sound of battle, went into a double quick, and, hastening through Gettysburg, struck the advancing rebel column just in time to seize and occupy the range of hills that overlooks the place from the northwest, in the direction of Chambersburg. General John F. Reynolds, a true Pennsylvanian, was in command of our entire advance, which consisted of the 1st and 11th Corps, about 22,000 strong. As General Wadsworth was placing his division in position, General Reynolds went forward quite alone to reconnoitre, when he discovered a heavy force of the enemy in a grove not far distant. Dismounting quickly, he crouched down by a fence through which he sought to survey the force and its position by means of his field glass, when a whistling ball from a sharpshooter's musket struck him in the neck. He fell on his face and baptized with his life-blood the soil which had given him birth. His untimely fall, especially at this crisis, and almost in sight of his childhood's home, was generally lamented. His lifeless form was borne away to the rear, just as the rebels in heavy force advanced upon not more than one-third their number. General Abner Doubleday had to assume command of our forces under this galling fire, having arrived with a portion of the First Corps, the remainder of which, and the Eleventh Corps, not being able to join them until two hours of fearful destruction had gone on. Our feeble advance was compelled to fall quickly back upon Seminary Hill, just west of the village, and were pursued very closely so much so that one portion of our line, seeing its opportunity, swung around rapidly, enveloping the rebel advance and capturing General Archer, the leader, and about eight hundred prisoners. On the arrival of the Eleventh Corps, General O. O. Howard, being the ranking officer present, assumed command, giving his place to General Carl Schertz. Our men, now emboldened by these fresh arrivals of helpers, and having alighted upon a fine commanding position, renewed the fight with spirit and wonderful success. This prosperous tide of things continued until about one o'clock p.m., when their right wing was assailed furiously by fresh troops, which proved to be General Ewell's Corps, which had been marching from York, directed by the thunder of battle. Thus flanked and outnumbered by the gathering hosts, the Eleventh Corps, 
which was most exposed to the enfilading fire of the newly arrived columns, began to waver, then to break, and soon fled in perfect rout. The First Corps was thus compelled to follow, or be annihilated. The two retreating columns met and mingled in more or less confusion in the streets of the town, where they greatly obstructed each other though the First Corps retained its organization quite unbroken. In passing through the town, the Eleventh Corps was especially exposed to the fire of the enemy, who pressed his advantage and captured thousands of prisoners. Our wounded, who up to this time had been quartered in Gettysburg, fell into the enemy's hands, and scarcely one half of our brave boys, who had so recently and proudly passed through the streets to the battle lines, had the privilege of returning, but either lay dead or dying on the well-fought fields, or were captives with a cruel foe. The number of killed and wounded showed how desperately they had fought, and the large number captured was evidence of the overwhelming numbers with which they had contended. General Buford, with his troopers, covered our retreat, showing as bold a front as possible to the enemy, who, it was feared, would follow fiercely, as they were very strong, and several hours of daylight yet remained. But doubtless fearing that a trap might be laid for them if they advanced too far, they contented themselves with only a portion of the borough, their main force occupying the hills, which form a grand amphitheater on the north and west. It would be difficult to refrain from saying that those rebel forces were prevented from advancing by some mighty unseen hand, the hand of him who watches over the destiny of nations. Our feeble and decimated forces took possession of Cemetery Hill, south of the town, and being reinforced by General Sickles' corps, they began to entrench themselves with earthworks and rifle pits, to extend their lines to right and left, and to select the best positions for our batteries. This work was continued quite late into the evening, the broad moonlight greatly facilitating the operations. General Meade, who had selected his ground for the impending battle along the banks of Pipe Creek, and who at one o'clock p.m. was at Taneytown, when the news of the fight and the death of the brave Reynolds at Gettysburg reached him, dispatched General Hancock to the scene of conflict to take command, and to ascertain whether Gettysburg afforded better ground than that which had been selected. Hancock arrived at Cemetery Hill just as our broken lines were hastily and confusedly retreating from the village, our advance, however, had already taken this commanding position and was making some preparations for resistance. The newly arrived general began at once to order the forces which had been engaged and others which were occasionally arriving. He ordered the occupancy of Culp's Hill on our extreme right and extended the lines to our left well up the high ground in the vicinity of Round Top a rocky eminence about two miles from Gettysburg, and nearly equidistant from the Emmitsburg and Taneytown roads. The line having been made as secure as possible, Hancock wrote to Meade that the position was excellent. His dispatch had scarcely gone when he was relieved by General Slocum, a ranking officer, and so, leaving the field, Hancock hastened to report in person to his chief the condition of things at Gettysburg. On arriving, Meade informed him that he had decided to fight at Gettysburg, and had sent orders to the various commands to that effect. Then together they rode to Gettysburg, arriving about eleven o'clock at night. All night long our forces were concentrating before this historic village, where they were all found on the morning of the 2nd of July, except the 6th Corps, General Sedgwick's, which did not arrive until 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 
after marching nearly all the previous night. Second Day's Fight Until three o'clock all was quiet along the battle lines, except an occasional picket or sharpshooter's fire. However, there had been considerable maneuvering. On our left, General Sickles, in his eagerness for a fight, had advanced his corps across the Emmitsburg Road, and on a wood-crowned ridge in the immediate vicinity of the main portion of the rebel army. General Meade, in his inspection of the lines, remonstrated against the perilous position which Sickles had taken the liberty to gain. He, however, intimated that, if desired, he would withdraw to the ridge which Meade had justly indicated as the proper place where our forces would be better protected, and would be able to cover Round Top, a point which was considered essential to retain. General Meade thereupon expressed his fear to Sickles that the enemy would not permit him quietly to retire from the trap in which he had placed his foot, and the last words had scarcely fallen from his lips when the rebel batteries were opened with fearful accuracy and at short range, and the infantry came on with their fierce charging yell. General Longstreet was in command. With so long and strong lines of infantry in his front, which lapped over his flanks on either side, and a fearful enfilading fire from the heavy batteries on Seminary Hill, Sickles and his brave men were torn, shattered, overwhelmed, and with terrible loss and in great confusion, fell back to the ridge from which he ought not to have advanced. In the struggle, the rebels made a desperate attempt to reach and possess Round Top, which they came near to doing before General Sykes, who had been ordered to advance and hold it, had gained the elevation. But their failure to possess this coveted prize proved a great disaster, for before they could withdraw their charging columns across the plain between Round Top and the ridge where Sickles stood at the beginning of the fray, they were attacked by General Hancock with a heavy force, and driven almost like chaff before the wind. Their loss was terrible. At the close of this encounter our line stood precisely where General Meade desired they should before the fight commenced, with Round Top fully in our possession, and now strongly fortified with heavy artillery and good infantry support. On our right, General Ewell had succeeded in pushing back some portions of our lines under Slocum, who occupied Culp's Hill, and some of our fortified lines and rifle pits were occupied by the rebels. Night came on to close the dreadful day. Thus far the battle had been mostly in the advantage of the rebels. They held the ground where Reynolds had fallen, also Seminary Ridge and the elevation whence the Eleventh Corps had been driven. They also occupied the ridge on which Sickles had commenced to fight. Sickles himself was hors de combat, with a shattered leg which had to be amputated, and not far from twenty thousand of our men had been killed, wounded, and captured. The rebels had also lost heavily, but as they themselves believed, they were the winners. General Lee, in his official report, says, quote, After a severe struggle, Longstreet succeeded in getting possession of and holding the desired ground. Ewell also carried some of the strong positions which he assailed, and the result was such as to lead to the belief that he would ultimately be able to dislodge the enemy. The battle ceased at dark. These partial successes determined me to continue the assault next day. End quote. During these days of deadly strife and of unprecedented slaughter, our cavalry was by no means idle. On the morning of the first, Kilpatrick advanced his victorious squadrons to the vicinity of Abbottstown, where they struck a force of rebel cavalry, which they scattered, capturing several prisoners, and then rested. 
To the ears of the alert chieftain came the sound of battle at Gettysburg, accompanied with the intelligence, from prisoners mostly, that Stuart's main force was bent on doing mischief on the right of our infantry lines, which were not far from the knight's bivouac. He appeared instinctively to know where he was most needed, so, in the absence of orders, early the next morning he advanced to Hunterstown, at this point were the extreme wings of the infantry lines, and, as Kilpatrick expected, he encountered the rebel cavalry, commanded by his old antagonists, Stuart, Lee, and Hampton. The early part of the day was spent mostly in reconnoitering, but all the latter part of the day was occupied in hard, bold, and bloody work. Charges and countercharges were made. The carbine, pistol, and sabre were used by turns, and the artillery thundered even late after the infantry around Gettysburg had sunk to rest, well nigh exhausted with the bloody carnage of the weary day. But Stuart, who had hoped to break in upon our flank and rear, and to pounce upon our trains, was not only foiled in his endeavor by the gallant Kilpatrick, but also driven back upon his infantry supports, and badly beaten. In the night Kilpatrick, after leaving a sufficient force to prevent Stuart from doing any special damage on our right, swung around with the rest of his troopers to the left of our line, near Round Top, and was there prepared for any work which might be assigned him. THE LAST EFFORT Friday, July 3. The sun rose bright and warm, and looked down upon the blackened corpses of the dead, which were strewn over the bloody earth, upon the wounded who had not been cared for, and upon long glistening lines of armed men, ready to renew the conflict, each antagonist rousing every slumbering element of power, seemed to be resolved upon victory or death. The fight commenced early by an attack of General Slocum's men, who, determined to regain the rifle pits they had lost the evening before, descended like an avalanche upon the foe. The attack met with a prompt response from General Ewell. But after several hours of desperate fighting, victory perched upon the Union banners, and with great loss and slaughter the rebels were driven out of the breastworks, and fell back upon their main lines near Benner's Hill. This successful move on the part of our boys in blue was followed by ominous lull, or quiet, which continued about three hours. Meanwhile the silence was fitfully broken by an occasional spit of fire, while every preparation was being made for a last supreme effort, which, it was expected, would decide the mighty contest. The scales were being poised for the last time, and upon one side or the other was soon to be written the main imene tekel ufarzin. Hearts either trembled or waxed strong in the awful presence of this responsibility. At length one o'clock arrived. A signal gun was fired and then at least one hundred and twenty-five guns from Hill and Longstreet concentrated and crossed their fires upon Cemetery Hill, the center and key of our position. Just behind this crest, though much exposed, were General Meade's headquarters. For nearly two hours this hill was plowed and torn by solid shot and bursting shell, while about one hundred guns on our side, mainly from this crest and round top, made sharp response. The earth and the air shook for miles around with the terrific concussion, which came no longer in volleys, but in a continual roar. So long and fearful a cannonade was never before witnessed on this continent. The destruction was terrible. But the advantage was decidedly in favor of the rebels, whose guns were superior in number to ours, and of heavier caliber, 
and had been concentrated for the attack. A spectator of the Union Army thus describes the scene. Quote, the storm broke upon us so suddenly that soldiers and officers, who leaped as it began from their tents, or from lazy siestas on the grass, were stricken in their rising with mortal wounds and died, some with cigars between their teeth, some with pieces of food in their fingers, and one at least, a pale young German from Pennsylvania, with a miniature of his sister in his hands. Horses fell, shrieking such awful cries as Cooper told of, and writhing themselves about in hopeless agony. The boards of fences, scattered by the explosion, flew in splinters through the air. The earth, torn up in clouds, blinded the eyes of hurrying men, and through the branches of trees and among the gravestones of the cemetery a shower of destruction crashed ceaselessly. As, with hundreds of others, I groped through this tempest of death for the shelter of the bluff, an old man, a private in a company belonging to the 24th Michigan, was struck scarcely ten feet away by a cannonball, which tore through him, extorting such a low, intense cry of mortal pain as I pray God I may never hear again. The hill, which seemed alone devoted to this reign of death, was clear in nearly all its unsheltered places within five minutes after the fire began. End quote. A correspondent from the Confederate Army thus describes this artillery contest. Quote, I have never yet heard such tremendous artillery firing. The enemy must have had over 100 guns, which, in addition to our 115, made the air hideous with the most discordant noise. The very earth shook beneath our feet, and the hills and rocks seemed to reel like a drunken man. For one hour and a half this most terrific fire was continued, during which time the shrieking of shell, the crash of fallen timbers, the fragments of rocks flying through the air, shattered from the cliffs by solid shot, the heavy mutterings from the valley between the opposing armies, the splash of bursting shrapnel, and the fierce neighing of wounded artillery horses, made a picture terribly grand and sublime, but which my pen utterly fails to describe. End quote. Gradually the fire on our side began to slacken, and General Meade, learning that our guns were becoming hot, gave orders to cease firing and to let the guns cool, though the rebel balls were making fearful havoc among our gunners while our infantry sought poor shelter behind every projection, anxiously awaiting the expected charge. At length the enemy, supposing that our guns were silenced, deemed that the moment for an irresistible attack had come. Accordingly, as a lion emerges from his lair, he sallied forth, when strong lines of infantry, nearly three miles in length, with doubled lines of skirmishers in front, and heavy reserves in rear, advanced with desperation to the final effort. They moved with steady, measured tread over the plain below, and began the ascent of the hills occupied by our forces, concentrating somewhat upon General Hancock, though stretching across our entire front says a correspondent of the Richmond Enquirer, quote, Just as Pickett was getting well under the enemy's fire, our batteries ceased firing. This was a fearful moment for Pickett and his brave command. Why do not our guns reopen their fire, is the inquiry that rises upon every lip. Still, our batteries are silent as death, end quote and this undoubtedly decided the issue, was God's handwriting on the wall. The rebel guns had been thundering so long and ceaselessly that they were now unfit for use, 
and ceased firing from very necessity. Agate, correspondent of the Cincinnati Gazette, gives the following graphic description of the struggle. Quote, the great, desperate, final charge came at four. The rebels seemed to have gathered up all their strength and desperation for one fierce, convulsive effort that should sweep over and wash out our obstinate resistance. They swept up as before, the flower of their army to the front, victory staked upon the issue. In some places they literally lifted up and pushed back our lines, but that terrible position of ours, wherever they entered it, enfilading fires from half a score of crests swept away their columns, like merest chaff. Broken and hurled back, they easily fell into our hands, and on the center and left, the last half hour brought more prisoners than all the rest. So it was along the whole line, but it was on the second corps that the flower of the rebel army was concentrated. It was there that the heaviest shock beat upon and shook, and even sometimes crumbled our lines. We had some shallow rifle pits with barricades of rails from the fences. The rebel line, stretching away miles to the left, in magnificent array, but strongest here, Pickett's splendid division of Longstreet's Corps in front, the best of A.P. Hill's veterans in support, came steadily, and as it seemed resistlessly sweeping up. Our skirmishers retired slowly from the Emmitsburg Road, holding their ground tenaciously to the last. The rebels reserved their fire till they reached the same Emmitsburg Road, then opened with a terrific crash. From a hundred iron throats, meantime, their artillery had been thundering on our barricades. Hancock was wounded. Gibbon succeeded to the command an approved soldier and ready for the crisis. As the tempest of fire approached its height, he walked along the line and renewed his orders to the men to reserve their fire. The rebels, three lines deep, came steadily up. They were in point-blank range. At last the order came. From thrice six thousand guns there came a sheet of smoky flame a crash, a rush of leaden death. The line literally melted away, but there came the second, resistless still. It had been our supreme effort. On the moment, we were not equal to another. Up to the rifle pits, across them, over the barricades, the momentum of their charge, the mere machine strength of their combined action, swept them on. Our thin line could fight, but it had not weight enough to oppose to this momentum. It was pushed behind the guns. Right on came the rebels. They were upon our guns, were bayoneting the gunners, were waving their flags over our pieces. But they had penetrated to the fatal point. A storm of grape and canister tore its way from man to man and marked its track with corpses straight down their line. They had exposed themselves to the enfilading fire of the guns on the western slope of Cemetery Hill. That exposure sealed their fate. The line reeled back, disjointed already, in an instant in fragments. Our men were just behind the guns. They leaped forward upon the disordered mass, but there was little need of fighting now. A regiment threw down its arms, and, with colors at its head, rushed over and surrendered. All along the field, smaller detachments did the same. Webb's brigade brought in eight hundred, taken in as little time as it requires to write the simple sentence that tells it. Gibbon's old division took fifteen stand of colors. 
Over the fields the escaped fragments of the charging line fell back. The battle there was over. A single brigade, Harrow's, of which the 7th Michigan is part, came out with 54 less officers and 793 less men than it took in. So the whole corps fought. So, too, they fought farther down the line. It was a fruitless sacrifice. They gathered up their broken fragments, formed their lines, and slowly marched away. It was not a rout. It was a bitter, crushing defeat. For once the Army of the Potomac had won a clean, honest, acknowledged victory. End quote. General Pickett's division was nearly annihilated. One of his officers recounted that, as they were charging over the grassy plain, he threw himself down before a murderous discharge of grape and canister, which mowed the grass and men all around him, as though a scythe had been swung just above his prostrate form. During the terrific cannonade and subsequent charges, our ammunition and other trains had been parked in rear of Round Top, which gave them splendid shelter. Partly to possess this train, but mainly to secure this commanding position, General Longstreet sent two strong divisions of infantry with heavy artillery to turn our flank and to drive us from this ground. Kilpatrick, with his division, which had been strengthened by Merritt's regular brigade, was watching this point, and waiting for an opportunity to strike the foe. It came at last. Emerging from the woods in front of him came a strong battle line, followed by others. Fall of General Farnsworth To the young Farnsworth was committed the task of meeting infantry with cavalry in an open field. Placing the 5th New York in support of Elder's Battery, which was exposed to a galling fire, but made reply with characteristic rapidity, precision, and slaughter, Farnsworth quickly ordered the 1st Virginia, 1st Vermont, and 18th Pennsylvania in line of battle, and galloped away and charged upon the flank of the advancing columns. The attack was sharp, brief, and successful, though attended with great slaughter. But the rebels were driven upon their main lines, and the flank movement was prevented. Thus the cavalry added another dearly earned laurel to its chaplet of honor. Dearly earned, because many of their bravest champions fell upon that bloody field. Kilpatrick, in his official report of this sanguinary contest, says, quote, In this charge fell the brave Farnsworth. Short and brilliant was his career. On the 29th of June a general, on the 1st of July, he baptized his star in blood, and on the 3rd, for the honor of his young brigade and the glory of his corps, he yielded up his noble life, End quote. Thus ended the Battle of Gettysburg, the bloody turning point of the rebellion, the bloody baptism of the redeemed republic. Nearly 20,000 men from the Union ranks had been killed and wounded, and a larger number of the rebels, making the enormous aggregate of at least 40,000, whose blood was shed to fertilize the Tree of Liberty. In the evening twilight of that eventful day, General Meade penned the following interesting dispatch to the government. Quote, Headquarters Army of the Potomac, near Gettysburg, July 3, 8.30 p.m. To Major General Halleck, General-in-Chief. The enemy opened at 1 o'clock p.m. from about 150 guns. They concentrated upon my left center, continuing without intermission for about three hours, at the expiration of which time he assaulted my left center twice, being upon both occasions handsomely repulsed with severe loss to them, 
leaving in our hands nearly three thousand prisoners. Among the prisoners are Major General Armistead, and many colonels and officers of lesser note. The enemy left many dead upon the field, and a large number of wounded in our hands. The loss upon our side has been considerable. Major General Hancock and Brigadier General Gibbon were wounded. After the repelling of the assault, indications leading to the belief that the enemy might be withdrawing, an armed reconnaissance was pushed forward from the left, and the enemy found to be in force. At the present hour, all is quiet. The New York cavalry have been engaged all day on both flanks of the enemy, harassing and vigorously attacking him with great success, notwithstanding they encountered superior numbers, both of cavalry and artillery. The army is in fine spirits. George G. Meade, Major General Commanding. End quote. On the following morning of the 4th of July, General Meade issued an address to the army. Quote, Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, near Gettysburg, July 4. The commanding general, in behalf of the country, thanks the Army of the Potomac for the glorious result of the recent operations. Our enemy, superior in numbers and flushed with the pride of a successful invasion, attempted to overcome or destroy this army. Utterly baffled and defeated, he has now withdrawn from the contest. The privations and fatigues the army has endured, and the heroic courage and gallantry it has displayed, will be matters of history to be ever remembered. Our task is not yet accomplished, and the commanding general looks to the army for greater efforts to drive from our soil every vestige of the presence of the invader. It is right and proper that we should, on suitable occasions, return our grateful thanks to the almighty disposer of events that in the goodness of his providence he has thought fit to give victory to the cause of the just by command of major general meade s williams a a general End quote. it is fitting we should close this chapter with president lincoln's brief yet comprehensive announcement to the country Quote, Washington, D.C., July 4, 1863, 10 a.m. The President of the United States announces to the country that the news from the Army of the Potomac up to 10 o'clock p.m. of the 3rd is such as to cover the Army with the highest honor, to promise great success to the cause of the Union, and to claim the condolence of all for the many gallant fallen, and that for this he especially desires that on this day he whose will, not ours, should ever be done, be everywhere remembered and reverenced with the profoundest gratitude. Abraham Lincoln. End, quote. End of chapter 12, part 2. Chapter 13 of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry, Part 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by William Glazier. Chapter 13, Part 1. Retreat of the Rebels from Gettysburg, 1863. National Rejoicing the enemy retreating feebly pursued reconnaissances kilpatrick gives the enemy a fourth of july entertainment at monterey pass storm and terror immense train destroyed and hosts of prisoners taken pitiable conditions of stuart's cavalry battle of hagerstown captains penfield and dahlgren wounded wonderful exploits of a union scout Kilpatrick and Buford at Williamsport, 
Cavalry fight at Boonesboro. Stuart defeated. Hagerstown retaken. Orders to advance one day too late. Kilpatrick chases the flying foe. Fight at Falling Waters, last act in the drama. Great bravery of Union troops. Last vestige of the invaders wiped out. Bivouac and rest. The victory at Gettysburg, though purchased at so dear a price, when announced to the people, produced a deep and widespread joy, which contributed to make the 4th of July doubly memorable. The gallant behavior of our men furnished a theme for general exultation, and the removal of the threatened disaster foreshadowed in the pompous and successful invasion made every true American breathe more freely but the work of the soldier was not yet done the feet of the invaders were still upon free soil and though his ranks had been thinned by desertions and by unprecedented casualties in battle and he had been thwarted in all the important minuet of his plan he was still formidable and compelled to fight with desperation if attacked to prevent utter destruction some apprehension that the enemy was at least contemplating a speedy retreat was entertained during the night that followed the third bloody day general pleasanton chief of cavalry urged general meade to advance in force upon the beaten foe alleging that they were not only greatly weakened by their losses but undoubtedly demoralized in consequence of repulse and probable scarcity of ammunition to ascertain positively what could be of these probabilities pleasanton was directed to make a reconnaissance towards the rebel rear accordingly several detachments of cavalry were thrust out on different roads where they rode all night general gregg on our right went about twenty-two miles on the road to chambersburg and returning early on the morning of the fourth reported that the road was strewn with wounded and stragglers ambulances and caissons and general debris which indicated that the enemy was retreating as rapidly as possible and was passing through a terrible season of demoralization the testimony of the mute witnesses of disaster was corroborated by that of the many prisoners which easily fell into gregg's hands other expeditions returning later in the day had similar reports to render of what they had seen and heard and now came the time for energetic cavalry movements while our infantry was resting or engaged in burying our own and the rebel dead within our lines the cavalry was dispatched to do all the damage it could upon the retreating rebel columns kilpatrick on their trail kilpatrick having assembled his immortalized division on the plain at the foot of round top on the morning of the fourth discoursed to them eloquently for a few moments on the interests of the times he assured his men that their noble deeds were not passing by unnoticed nor would be unrequited and that they were already a part of a grand history he trusted that their future conduct would be a fair copy of the past but his pathetic and patriotic accents had scarcely died upon the ears of his brave command when the shrill bugle-blast brought eager men and grazing horses in line of march orders had been received by kilpatrick to repair as swiftly as possible to the passes of the catoncton mountains to intercept the enemy now known to be flying southward at a rapid rate the command had gone but a short distance when rain began to fall in torrents as is usually the case after great battles especially when much artillery is used but through mud in places to the horses bodies through brooks swollen enormously and through the falling floods the troopers pressed forward to the accomplishment of their task about five o'clock p m kilpatrick reached emmitsburg where he was joined by portions of general gregg's command including the harris light which had been kept mostly in reserve during the conflicts of the past few days thus reinforced this intrepid leader marched directly towards the monterey pass arriving at the foot of this rocky defile in the mountains in the midst of pitchy darkness as was anticipated a heavy rebel train was then trying to make its escape through the gorge guarded by stuart's cavalry with light artillery this artillery was planted in a position to rake the narrow road upon which kilpatrick was advancing but the darkness was so intense that the guns could be of little use except to make the night terribly hideous with their bellowings the echoes of which reverberated in the mountain gorges in a most frightful manner 
to add to the horrors of the scene and position the rain fell in floods accompanied with groaning thunders while lightnings flashed from cloud to cloud over our heads and cleft the darkness only to leave friend and foe enveloped in greater darkness in the intervals of light by these flashes however we gained a momentary glimpse of each other's position and as we dashed forward in the gloom we were further directed by the fire of the artillery and the desultory fire of the cavalry surgeon moore gave the following account of this affair quote, we do not hesitate in saying and have good reason to know that had any want of firmness on the part of the leader or any indecision or vacillation appeared and a mischance occurred this splendid command would then and there have been lost Quote, but with unflinching and steady purpose, bold bearing, and a mind equal to the emergency, the general rode to the head of the column, reassured his frightened people, and, notwithstanding the intense darkness that hid friend from foe, he made such skilful dispositions, and then attacked the hidden foe with such impetuosity that he fled in wild dismay, leaving his guns, a battle flag, and four hundred prisoners in the victor's hand the pass was gained and pennington's and elder's guns were soon echoing and re-echoing through the mountain defiles the artillery opened thus on the flying columns of the routed foe who with wagons ambulances caissons and the debris of a shattered army were rushing in chaotic confusion down the narrow mountain road and scattering through the fields and woods on the plains below all night long kilpatrick and his successful followers were gathering the spoils of their evening work wagon after wagon was overtaken captured and destroyed while hundreds of prisoners were easily captured this daring exploit placed kilpatrick in advance of the rebel army giving him a fine opportunity to obstruct their pathway of retreat and to destroy whatever could be of any use to them had he not been cumbered with so many prisoners it is not in the power of any one to estimate the damage he would have done in his official report he says inner quote, on this day i captured eighteen hundred and sixty prisoners including many officers of rank and destroyed the rebel general wells immense wagon train nine miles long it should be stated that these wagons were mostly laden with the ripened and gathered crops of pennsylvania and maryland and with the plunder of private and public stores including dry goods and groceries of every variety and quality none who saw it will ever forget the appearance of that mountain road the day following this night's foray stuart who was ingloriously defeated at monterey retired toward emmitsburg with about fifty prisoners that he had captured during and after the fight he then moved southward until he struck an unfrequented road which leads over the mountains via wolf's tavern by this turn he avoided immediate contact with our cavalry but about five o'clock p m as he was about to debouch into the valley kilpatrick who was watching for him as a cat does a mouse attacked him with artillery and fought him till dark this fight occurred near smithburg whence the prisoners in kilpatrick's hands were sent to south mountain guarded by the harris light darkness having put an end to the contest kilpatrick marched through cave town to boonesboro where he bivouacked for the night stuart it was ascertained marched till about midnight to the small town of leidersburg where he rested his worn and wearied command his condition was really pitiable a large number of his men were mounted on shoeless horses whose leanness showed that they had made a very long march through and from virginia or as was the case with a large proportion of them they had fat horses which were stolen from the fields and stalls of the invaded states but being entirely unused to such hard and cruel treatment as they were now receiving were well nigh unserviceable lameness and demoralization were prominent characteristics among animals and men july sixth this morning at an early hour kilpatrick's crowd of prisoners were turned over into the hands of general french and then his command marched to hagerstown taking possession of the place in advance of stuart whose approach about eleven o'clock was met with determined resistance and at first with great success a heavy battle was fought in which kilpatrick's men showed their usual prowess and strength had not rebel infantry come to the aid of his cavalry stuart would have suffered a stunning blow 
for several hours the contest was wholly between cavalry and light artillery charges of great daring and skill were made one reporter says quote, elder gave them grape and canister and the fifth new york sabres while the first vermont used their carbines unquote. in one of those charges made in the face of a very superior force captain james a penfield of the fifth new york at the head of his company had his horse killed under him and while struggling to extricate himself from the animal which lay upon him in part he was struck a fearful blow of a sabre on the head which came near severing it, it in twain thus wounded with blood streaming down upon his long beard and clothes he was made a prisoner in a similar charge the gallant captain ulrich dahlgren lost a leg though not his valuable life it appeared as though the rebels were afforded an opportunity to avenge themselves in part for the shameful losses which they had sustained in this very place by the strategic operations of a union scout by the name of c a phelps during the incipient step of the invasion we will let the scout relate his own story which is corroborated by a single officer who from out of the lofty peaks of the mountains witnessed the exciting denouement the scout proceeds to say quote, i was very anxious to learn all about general stuart's force and contemplated movements and resolved to see the general himself or some of his staff officers soon after he entered hagerstown accordingly i procured of a union man a suit of raglings knocked off one boot heel to make one leg appear shorter than the other and put a gimblet a toe-string and an old broken jack-knife in my pockets my jewelry corresponded with my clothes i adopted the name of george fry a harvest hand of dr farney from wolftown on the north side of the mountain and i was a cripple with rheumatism having completed arrangements with dr farney mr landers and other union men that they might be of service to me in case the rebels should be suspicious of my character i hobbled away on my perilous journey and entered the city by leaping the high stone wall which guards it on the north side near the depot this occurred just as the town clock struck one it was a clear starlight night and the glistening sabres of the sentries could be seen as they walked their lonely beat scarcely had i gained the sidewalk leading to the centre of the town when the sentry nearest me cried halt who goes there a friend i replied a friend to north or south to the south of course and all right advance then was the response on reaching him he asked me what could be my business at this hour of the night i told him i had come in to see our brave boys who could whip the yankees so handsomely as they had done especially at bull run and chancellorsville we fell at once into the discussion of the war questions of the day in the midst of our colloquy up came the officer of the guard on his grand round who after probing me thoroughly as he thought with many questions finally said had you not better go with me to see general stuart i should really like to get a sight of the general i quickly replied for i never seen a real general in all my life i was soon in the presence of the general who received me very cordially i found him to be a man a little above the medium height and fine-looking his features are very distinct in outline his nose long and sharp his eyes keen and restless his complexion is florid and his manners affable i told him who i was and where i lived when at home wolftown exclaimed the general have not the yankees a large wagon train there i told him they had and then turning to one of his staff officers he said i must have it it would be a fine prize i noted his words and determined if i possessed any yankee wit to make use of it on this occasion general said i y'all don't think a captor in them there yankee wagons do you why not i have here five thousand cavalry and sixteen pieces of artillery and i understand the train is lightly guarded i saw that he had been properly informed and i told him they came there last evening with twelve big brass cannon and three regiments of foot soldiers and if he were to try to go through the gap of the mountain they would shoot all the cannon off right in the gap and kill all his horses and men the general smiled at my naive answer and said i had a strange idea of war if i thought so many men would be killed at once and added that i would not be a very brave soldier i replied that many times 
I had felt like going into the Confederate Army, but my rheumatism kept me out. After a while, the general concluded not to try the train, and I was heartily glad, for he would have taken at least two hundred wagons easily, as they were guarded by not more than three hundred men. He then gave orders to have the main body of his cavalry move toward Green Castle, and I distinctly heard him give orders to the major to remain in town with fifty men as rear guard, and to send on the army mail, which was expected there about six the next evening. I made up my mind that it would be a small mail he would get, as I proposed to myself to be postmaster for once. After seeing the general and his cavalry move out of town, I went directly for my horse, which I had concealed in a safe place some distance from the city. Meanwhile, surveying the ground to see which way I could best come in to capture the mail, and determined to charge the place on the pike from Boonesboro, and made my arrangements to that effect. I got a Union man by the name of Thornburg to go into the town and notify the Union people that, when the town clock struck 6 p.m., I would charge in and capture the rebel mail, at the risk of losing my own life and every man with me. I had now but eight men, two having been sent to General Stahl with dispatches. I then returned to Boonesboro and found my men waiting for me. I told them my intentions, and offered to send back to his regiment any man who feared to go with me, but every one bravely said he would not leave me, nor surrender without my order. I then ordered them to bring out their horses, and we were soon on the road. It was a moment of thrilling interest to us all as we approached Hagerstown, and lingered to hear the signal strokes on that monitor in the old church tower. At the appointed time, we had already entered into the edge of the town. With a wild shout, we dashed into the streets, and the Major and his fifty braves fled without firing a shot. We captured sixteen prisoners, twenty-six horses, several small arms, and a heavy army mail, which contained three important dispatches from Jefferson Davis, and two from the rebel Secretary of War to General Lee. All this substantial booty we safely carried within our own lines, without the loss of a man or a horse. Many thanks are due to Dr. C. R. Doran, Mr. Robert Thornburg, for their kind and timely assistance, and also to Mrs. Susie Carson and Addie Brenner, who did so much for the comfort of our brave men. I still have in my possession some choice flowers preserved from a bouquet presented to me by Miss Carson the evening we captured the rebel mail, and though the flowers have faded, the good deeds done by the giver will ever grow bright through coming time. All honor to the brave Union ladies. In these same streets, where Captain Briggs with his telescope witnessed the successful charge of the scouting party, raged the battle hotly on the 6th of July. But as the rebel infantry was advancing with heavy artillery to the aid of Stuart's cavalry, Kilpatrick was sorely pressed and at length compelled to retire. His ears were now saluted with the sound of artillery in the direction of Williamsport, and a messenger arrived with the intelligence that General John Buford, who had advanced through the South Mountain Pass, was now attempting to destroy Lee's immense supply train, which was packed near Williamsport and not very heavily guarded. Kilpatrick desired no better work than to assist his brave comrade, and he at once hastened down the main street and soon joined Buford in the work of destruction. These combined commands were making fearful havoc in the rebel commissary and quartermaster stores. Many wagons were burned, and the whole train would have shared the same fate had not the united infantry and cavalry of the enemy come down upon us in overwhelming force. But we were not to be driven away very suddenly nor cheaply. Long and desperately we contended with the accumulating forces, until darkness came on, when we found ourselves completely enveloped by the foe nothing but splendid generalship and true bravery on the part of our officers and men saved us from capture and destruction some of our number were made prisoners but our losses were very small considering the amount of depredations we had committed and the great danger to which we were exposed as it was the commands were successfully withdrawn from their hazardous position and through the darkness of the night we, we crossed antietam creek and bivouacked in safety on the opposite bank several prisoners were captured from the rebels during the fights of the day they were mostly from alabama and louisiana regiments and they state that their army is all together and well on its way to the river 
they speak doubtfully of lee's recrossing the potomac end of chapter thirteen part one chapter thirteen of three years in the federal cavalry part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org three years in the federal cavalry by willard glazier chapter thirteen part two the cavalry bivouac july seven our cavalry is in the vicinity of boonesboro and is acting mostly on the defensive the enemy in force is in our front and an attack is momentarily expected at six p m to horse was sounded throughout our camps and after waiting two hours in rain ready for a move orders were received to return to our quarters rain is now falling in torrents accompanied with fearful thunderings and lightning unpleasant as it is we welcome its pelting hoping that the storm will raise the potomac above the fording mark and thus give meade an opportunity to attack lee before he has time to recross the river into virginia we know that his pontoons at falling waters have been totally destroyed by our cavalry and by the high water and that the only ford available is at williamsport and hence we welcome the falling floods many of us have to lie down in water which however is not very cold but the night is very tedious july eight the sun came out bright and warm this morning enabling us in a few moments to dry our drenched blankets and garments the roads however abound in mud and the streams are enormously swollen early in the day our pickets were driven in along the antietam and the enemy advanced with such force that by noon the plains around boonesboro were the scene of a furious cavalry engagement cavalry battle at boonesboro dr moore from whose excellent reports we have before quoted gave the following graphic description of this cavalry duel quote, buford had the right and kilpatrick the left the movements of the cavalry lines in this battle were among the finest sights the author remembers ever to have seen it was here he first saw the young general kilpatrick and little thought that one day the deeds he saw him perform he would transmit to paper and to posterity here all day long the rebel and the union cavalry chiefs fought mounted and dismounted and striving in every possible manner to defeat and rout the other the din and roar of battle that from ten a m until long after dark had rolled over the plains and back through the mountains told to the most anxious generals of them all meade and lee how desperate was the struggle stuart and his men fighting for the safety of the rebel army buford and kilpatrick for south mountain's narrow pass just as the setting sun sent his last rays over that muddy battlefield buford and kilpatrick were seen rapidly approaching each other from opposite directions they met a few hasty words were exchanged and away dashed buford far off to the right and kilpatrick straight to the centre and in less than twenty minutes from right to centre and from centre to left the clear notes of the bugle rang out the welcome charge with one long wild shout those glorious squadrons of buford and kilpatrick from right to left as far as the eye could see in one unbroken line charged upon the foe the shock was irresistible the rebel line was broken the routed enemy confessed the superiority of our men as they fled from the well-fought field leaving their dead and dying behind them and our heroic chiefs led back to their victorious squadrons and while resting on their laurels gave their brave weary troops a momentary repose thus far our cavalry had done much to obstruct the retreat of the rebel army and had inflicted incalculable losses of men and materials but the pursuit of our main army was not correspondingly vigorous two pretty good reasons may be assigned for this seeming incompetency or want of energy the first reason is found in the fact that scarcely more than a brigade of infantry had been kept in reserve during the great and destructive battle of gettysburg while the three days of struggle had well nigh exhausted our entire strength rest was therefore greatly needed and a general engagement was to be guarded against it should also be remembered that nearly one-fourth of our entire army was hour to combat 
the second reason may be found in the heavy rain which fell impeding pursuers as one writer says more than pursued though they need not but the retreating army has this advantage it usually chooses its own route which it can generally cover or hide by means of stratagem so that it requires time as well as study to effectually pursue perhaps a third reason for our tardiness of pursuit should be presented does it not appear to be an overruling act of providence had general meade advanced as it seemed he might have done with the resources at his command against the demoralized decimated and flying army with its ammunition quite exhausted and a swollen river unfordable and bridgeless between it and safety lee could not have escaped annihilation but the public sentiment of the country though forming and improving rapidly was not yet prepared for such a victory we needed to spend more treasure spill more blood sacrifice more precious lives to lift us up to those heights of public and political virtue where we could be safely entrusted with so dear a boon we were not then prepared for peace that sovereign balm for a nation's woe the tardiness with which our movements were made enabled the enemy to reach a good position near hagerstown which he began to fortify in such a manner as to cover his crossing meanwhile we understood that successful efforts were made to rebuild the bridge at falling waters general meade in his official report gives the following account of his pursuit quote, the fifth and sixth of july were employed in succoring the wounded and burying the dead major general sedgwick commanding the sixth corps having pushed the pursuit of the enemy as far as the fairfield pass and the mountains and reporting that the pass was very strong one in which a small force of the enemy could hold in check and delay for a considerable time any pursuing force i determined to follow the enemy by a flank movement and accordingly leaving mcintosh's brigade of cavalry and neal's brigade of infantry to continue harassing the enemy i put the army in motion for middleton and orders were immediately sent to major general french at frederick to reoccupy harper's ferry and send a force to occupy turner's pass in south mountains i subsequently ascertained that major general french had not only anticipated these orders in part but had pushed a cavalry force to williamsport and falling waters where they destroyed the enemy's pontoon bridge and captured its guard buford was at the same time sent to williamsport and hagerstown the duty above assigned to the cavalry was most successfully accomplished the enemy being greatly harassed his trains destroyed and many captures of guns and prisoners made july tenth this morning at five o'clock the cavalry advanced from boonesboro passed through needysville and crossed the antietam about ten o'clock at twelve o'clock we engaged the enemy at jones crossroads the harris light led the advance dismounted the rebels were driven three consecutive times from as many positions which they had chosen their resistance was by no means strong nor determined before night buford moved his command to sharpsburg on the extreme left of our lines and kilpatrick advanced to a position on the extreme right in the vicinity of hagerstown where he covered the road to gettysburg on the eleventh only picket skirmishes occupied the time but on the twelfth kilpatrick supported by a brigade of infantry under the command of brigadier-general ames of howard's corps advanced upon the enemy near hagerstown drove them from their works and then out of the streets and of the city and took permanent possession this successful movement greatly contracted our lines and brought our forces into a better position at the close of this enterprise as we are informed general meade called a council of war at which we discussed earnestly and long the propriety of attacking the enemy notwithstanding the anxiety of the chief commander to advance and reap the fruit of gettysburg five of his corps commanders out of eight argued against the measure and as meade did not desire to assume the grave responsibility of a movement against such protests no move was immediately attempted this statement may modify the condemnatory judgments which were formed against general meade and may prepare our minds rightly to interpret general a p howe's report of the general pursuit in narrating its spirit and progress he says quote, on the fourth of july it seemed evident enough that the enemy was retreating how far they were gone we could not see from the front we could see but a comparatively small force from the position where i was on sunday the fifth and sixth corps moved in pursuit as we moved 
a small rearguard of the enemy retreated we followed them with this small rearguard of the enemy before us up to fairfield in a gorge of the mountains there we again waited for them to go on there seemed to be no disposition to push this rear guard when we got up to fairfield a lieutenant from the enemy came into our lines and gave himself up he was a northern union man in service in one of the georgia regiments and without being asked he unhesitatingly told us when i met him as he was being brought in that he belonged to the artillery of the rear guard of the enemy and that they had but two rounds of ammunition with the rear guard but we waited there without receiving any orders to attack it was a place where as i informed general sedgwick we could easily attack the enemy with advantage but no movement was made until the enemy went away then one brigade of my division with some cavalry was sent to follow after them while the remainder of the sixth corps moved to the left we moved on through boonesboro and passed up on the pike road leading to hagerstown after passing boonesboro it became my turn to lead the sixth corps that day just before we started general sedgwick ordered me to move on and take up the best position i could over a little stream on the frederick side of funkstown as i moved on it was suggested to me by him to move carefully don't come into contact with the enemy we don't want to bring on a general engagement it seemed to be the current impression that it was not desired to bring on a general engagement i moved on until we came near funkstown general buford was along that way with his cavalry i had passed over the stream referred to and found a strong position which i concluded to take and wait for the sixth corps to come up in the meantime general buford who was in front came back to me and said i am pretty hardly engaged here i have used a great deal of my ammunition it is a strong place in front it is an excellent position it was a little farther out than i was near funkstown he said i have used a great deal of my ammunition and i ought to go to the right suppose you move up there or send up a brigade or even a part of one and hold that position said i i will do so at once if i can just communicate with general sedgwick i am ordered to take up a position over here and to hold it and the intimation conveyed to me was that they did not want to get into a general engagement i will send for general sedgwick and ask permission to hold that position and relieve you i accordingly sent a staff officer to general sedgwick with a request that i might go up at once and assist general buford stating that he had a strong position but his ammunition was giving out general buford remained with me until i should get an answer the answer was no we do not want to bring on a general engagement well said i buford what can i do he said they expect me to go farther to the right my ammunition is pretty much out that position is a strong one and we ought not to let it go i sent down again to general sedgwick stating the condition of general buford that he would have to leave unless he could get some assistance that his position was not far in front and that it seemed to me that we should hold it and i should like to send some force up to picket it at least after a time i got a reply that if general buford left i might occupy the position general buford was still with me and i said to him if you go away from there i will have to hold it that's all right he said i will go away he did so and i moved right up it was a pretty good position when you cover our troops soon after relieving buford we saw some rebel infantry advancing i do not know whether they brought them from hagerstown or from some other place they made three dashes not in heavy force upon our line to drive us back the troops that happened to be there on our line were what we considered in the army of the potomac unusually good ones they quietly repulsed the rebels twice and the third time they came up they sent them flying into funkstown yet there was no permission to move on and follow up the enemy we remained there some time until we had orders to move on and take a position a mile or more near hagerstown as we moved up we saw the rebels had some light field works hurriedly thrown up apparently to cover themselves while they recrossed the river i think we remained there three days and the third night i think after we got up into that position it was said the rebels recrossed the river sunday july twelfth i had the misfortune to be kicked off my pins last night just before we were relieved at the front approaching my sorrel pony from the rear in a careless manner for he could not see me until i got within short range when he raised his heels very suddenly and without ceremony planted them in my breast laying me not in the most gentle manner flat upon the ground medical aid is considered necessary to-day as i am suffering not a little 
but as the conflict was purely caused by my own folly i endure my pains with becoming patience to-day i found the following dispatches in some northern paper and i recorded them to show what contradictory reports will often find their way into the public press concerning men and measures Quote, mountain house near boonsboro july nine there has been no fighting this morning the fight of yesterday near boonsboro was between general buford and kilpatrick's cavalry and the rebel infantry principally on the bushwhacking style our troops fell back early in the day but subsequently reoccupied the ground artillery was used on both sides there is no truth in the reported death of general kilpatrick second dispatch boonsboro july nine eight p m there have been no active operations on our front to-day after the cavalry fight of yesterday the enemy drew in their force towards hagertown and formed a line on elevated ground from funktown on the right to the bend of the river below williamsport on the left thus uncovering the shepherdstown crossing scouts and reconnoitering parties report that lee is entrenching his front and drawing from his train on the virginia side and making general preparations for another battle it is contradicted to-night that we have a force on general lee's line of retreat in virginia july thirteenth all has been quiet along our lines to-day the army being pretty well rested by this time is waiting impatiently for the command to advance our position is also a good one though not better than that of the enemy we have every reason to believe that the rebel army is still on the north bank of the potomac the recent rains have raised the river above the fording mark however lee will undoubtedly fall back into virginia if he finds a good opportunity during the latter part of the day general meade finally decided to assault the position of the invaders very much to the delight of the rank and file of the army orders were promulgated to the effect that a strong and simultaneous advance must be made early in the morning of the fourteenth preparations were immediately begun falling waters kilpatrick and his cavalry were sent out on picket and advanced as near the enemy's lines as it was prudent not many hours of the night had passed away when kilpatrick discovered certain movements which indicated that the enemy was leaving his front prepared as he was to attack them by the morning light he was ready to follow up any movement which they might make hence at three o'clock in the morning of the fourteenth his advance guard moved forward upon the retreating enemy while information of this unexpected movement of the enemy was dispatched to general meade kilpatrick advanced towards williamsport with his usual rapidity and power driving and capturing everything before him informed by the citizens that the rear guard of the retreating army had but a few moments before started from the river he followed closely in their tracks and struck them at falling waters where after a brilliant and sharp conflict he bagged a large number of prisoners many a poor fellow never reached the long-looked-for virginia shore general meade then sent the following dispatch to washington headquarters army of the potomac july fourteenth three p m h w halleck general-in-chief my cavalry now occupy following waters having overtaken and captured a brigade of infantry fifteen hundred strong two guns two caissons two battle flags and a large number of small arms the enemy are all across the potomac george g meade major general later in the day he sent the following headquarters army of the potomac july fourteenth three thirty p m major general halleck general-in-chief my cavalry have captured five hundred prisoners in addition to those previously reported general pettigrew of the confederate army was killed this morning in the attack on the enemy's rear guard his body is in our hands g g meade major general these dispatches were afterward denied by general lee in a letter to his authorities as follows headquarters army of north virginia july eighteen sixty three general s cooper adjunct and inspector general c s a general i have seen in the northern papers what purports to be an official dispatch from general meade stating that he had captured a brigade of infantry two pieces of artillery two caissons and a large number of small arms as this army retired to the south bank of the potomac on the thirteenth and fourteenth instant this dispatch has been copied into the richmond papers and as its official character may cause it to be believed i desire to state that it is incorrect 
The enemy did not capture any organized body of men on that occasion, but only stragglers, and such as were left asleep on the road, exhausted by the fatigue and exposure of one of the most inclement nights I have ever known at this season of the year. It rained without cessation, rendering the road by which our troop marched towards the bridge at Falling Waters very difficult to pass and causing so much delay that the last of the troops did not cross the river at the bridge until one a m on the morning of the fourteenth while the column was thus detained on the road a number of men worn down with fatigue laid down in barns and by the roadside and though officers were sent back to arouse them as the troops moved on the darkness and rain prevented them from finding all and many were thus in this way left behind two guns were left on the road the horses that drew them became exhausted and the officers went back to procure others when they returned the rear of the column had passed the guns so far that it was deemed unsafe to send back for them and they were thus lost no arms cannons or prisoners were taken by the enemy in battle but only such as were left behind as i have described under the circumstances the number of stragglers thus lost i am unable to state with accuracy but it is greatly exaggerated in the dispatch referred to i am with great respect your obedient servant r e lee general this was evidently an attempt on the part of the rebel leader to disparage our victories and to wipe out of his record with a sort of ledger domain the disgraceful and disastrous denouement of his invasion in the following important statement general meade confirms his position by incontestable facts and shows how the matter stood headquarters army of the potomac august eighteen sixty three major general halleck general in chief my attention has been called to what purports to be an official dispatch of general r e lee commanding the rebel army to general s cooper adjunct and inspector general denying the accuracy of my telegram to you of july fourteenth announcing the result of the cavalry affair at falling waters i have delayed taking any notice of lee's report until the return of brigadier general kilpatrick absent on leaf who commanded the cavalry on the occasion referred to and on whose report from the field my telegram was based i now enclose the official report of brigadier general kilpatrick made after his attention had been called to lee's report you will see that he reiterates and confirms all that my dispatch averred and proves most conclusively that general lee has been deceived by his subordinates or he would never in the face of the facts now alleged have made the assertion his report claims it appears that i was in error in stating that the body of general pettigrew was left in our hands although i did not communicate that fact until an officer from the field reported to me he had seen the body it is now ascertained from the richmond papers that general pettigrew though mortally wounded in the affair was taken to winchester where he subsequently died the three battle flags captured on this occasion and sent to washington belonged to the fortieth forty seventh and fifty fifth virginia regiments of infantry general lee will surely acknowledge that these were not left in the hands of stragglers asleep in barns george g meade major general commanding kilpatrick in his letter of explanation referred to in the above dispatch gives the following graphic account of this last scene of the great drama of the invasion headquarters third division cavalry corps waterton junction virginia august to colonel a j alexander chief of staff of cavalry corps colonel in compliance with a letter just received from the headquarters of the cavalry corps of the army of the potomac directing me to give the facts connected with the fight at falling waters i have the honor to state that at three a m of the fourteenth ultimo i learned that the enemy's pickets were retiring in my front having been previously ordered to attack at seven a m i was ready to move at once at daylight i had reached the crest of hills occupied by the enemy an hour before and a few minutes before six general custer drove the rear guard of the enemy into the river at williamsport learning from citizens that a portion of the enemy had retreated in the direction of falling waters i at once moved rapidly for that point and came up with this rear guard of the enemy at seven thirty a m at a point two miles distant from falling waters we pressed on driving them before us capturing many prisoners and one gun when within a mile and a half of falling waters the enemy was found in large force drawn up in line of battle on the crest of a hill commanding the road on which i was advancing 
his left was protected by earthworks and his right extended to the woods on our left the enemy was when first seen in two lines of battle with arms stacked within less than one thousand yards from a large force a second piece of artillery with its support consisting of infantry was captured while attempting to get into position the gun was taken to the rear a portion of the sixth michigan cavalry seeing only that portion of the enemy behind the earthworks charged this charge was led by major weber and was the most gallant ever made at a trot he passed up the hill received the fire from the whole line and the next moment rode through and over the earthworks and passed to the right sabering the rebels along the entire line and returned with a loss of thirty killed wounded and missing including the gallant major weber killed i directed general custer to send forward one regiment as skirmishers they were repulsed before support could be sent them and driven back closely followed by the rebels until checked by the first michigan in a squadron of the eighth new york the second brigade having come up it was quickly thrown into position and after a fight of two hours and thirty minutes routed the enemy at all points and drove him towards the river within a short distance of the bridge general buford's command came up and took the advance we lost twenty-nine killed thirty-six wounded and forty missing we found upon the field one hundred and twenty-five dead rebels and brought away upward of fifty wounded a large number of the enemy's wounded were left upon the field in charge of their own surgeons we captured two guns three battle flags and upward of fifteen hundred prisoners to general custer and his brigade lieutenant pennington and his battery and one squadron of the eighth new york cavalry of general buford's command all praise is due very respectfully your obedient servant j kilpatrick brigadier general in his official report of operations from the twenty eighth of june when he assumed command of the third division kilpatrick says in this campaign my command has captured forty-five hundred prisoners nine guns and eleven battle flags never before in the history of warfare has it been permitted to any man commanding a division to include in a report about forty-five days operations such magnificent results as the last foot of the invaders disappeared from the soil where they had never been successful our gallant boys built their bivouac fires and rested themselves and their weary animals near the scene of their recent victory the telegraph lines which had so often been burdened with news of disaster now sang with joyful intelligence from all departments of our vast armies gettysburg was soon followed by vicksburg then port hudson the names being emblazoned upon many a glowing transparency to the honor of the heroes who had planned and the braves who had fought so successfully and well the news was welcomed with salutes of artillery and bonfires in most of the northern cities and villages while the whole mass of our people was jubilant and rejoicing on the fifteenth the president issued a proclamation of thanksgiving in which he recognized the hand of god in our victories and called upon the people to render the homage due to the divine majesty for the wonderful things he has done in the nation's behalf and to invoke the influence of his holy spirit to subdue the anger which has produced and so long sustained a needless and cruel rebellion in the midst of these rejoicings we end our chapter end of chapter thirteen part two chapter fourteen of three years in the federal cavalry part one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org three years in the federal cavalry by willard glazier chapter fourteen part one kilpatrick's gunboat expedition eighteen sixty three escape of lee into virginia reasons cavalry advance into the valley via harper's ferry and fight riot in new york and other northern cities again across the potomac on sacred soil blackberries and discipline mails battle of manassas gap mosby again and his bands author's birthday kilpatrick's gunboat expedition on the rappahannock cavalry captures navy complimented by superiors general advance of the army third cavalry battle at brandy station 
Stewart's cavalry worsted at Culpeper Courthouse. Sharp artillery practice at Raccoon Ford on the Rapidan. Special duties and special dangers. Good living along the Hazel and Robertson rivers. Important reconnaissance and raid. Hard fighting and narrow escape. Needed rest received. De paymaster. Rebel plan of attack foiled by a citizen informer. Suspicious activity on our front. This sudden and masterly movement of the rebels was a cutting surprise to General Meade, and a source of mortification and chagrin to all. Gloriously successful as we had been, it was evident that hesitation and indecision had greatly detracted from our laurels. We had won a world-renowned victory, but we had failed to reap all the legitimate fruits which our situation placed within our reach. General Lee had been terribly punished, but his escape was quite marvelous. One writer says, quote, When his shattered columns commenced their retreat from Gettysburg, few of his officers can have imagined that they would ever reach Virginia with their artillery and most of their trains. Unquote. And though their trains were severely handled and greatly injured, Yet the old rebel army of North Virginia, with nearly all its artillery, made its exit from soil too sacred to freedom for a rebel victory. Their losses, however, had been immense, and they were only too glad to escape in a manner very unlike the audacious way in which they had advanced but a few weeks previous into the northern states. It now became the policy of our leader to follow the fugitives as closely as the changed circumstances of affairs would permit, and to give the rebels no rest while he endeavored to press them determinedly and watch them by means of scouts and signal stations with a jealous eye. There is, however, a limit to the endurance which men and horses are capable of, and beyond this the overtaxed powers give way, and exhausted nature claims her rights few there are except those who have had experience who know how much privation the brave soldier and his general suffer in the toils of the field on the rapid march the hasty bivouac the broken slumbers the wakeful watchings and the scanty fare it must be remembered also that our army had made many forced marches describing in its route a line somewhat resembling the circumference of a great circle as a careful survey of the map of movements will show while the route of the enemy, who had several days the start of us, was more like the diameter of that circle. Our cavalry had not only fought and defeated the rebel cavalry on many sanguinary fields, but it had met the serried lines of their infantry also, as at Gettysburg, where the brave Fonsworth fell. Owing to this fatigue of our forces, our pursuit of the enemy was not as vigorous, it would seem in a cursory glance, as it should have been. As soon as it was ascertained that the rebel army was in full retreat, a force of our cavalry was sent across the Potomac at Harper's Ferry, bivouacking the night of the 14th of July on Bolivar Heights. Early the next morning we advanced on the Winchester Turnpike as far as Halltown, where we deflected on the right to the road to Shepherdstown. We had not proceeded far before we encountered the enemy's cavalry under Fitzhugh Lee with which we were soon involved in a spirited contest. At first, our troops were worsted and driven back a short distance, but having found a good position, we rallied and repulsed several desperate charges, inflicting heavy losses, until the rebels were glad to give up the game and consequently retired. Colonel Drake, 1st Virginia, and Colonel Gregg were among the rebels slain, while on our side the highest officer killed was Captain Fisher, of the 16th Pennsylvania. The fighting was done principally on foot. While these things were transpiring, Kilpatrick moved his division from Falling Waters to Boonesboro by way of Williamsport and Hagerstown. Sad evidences of the recent battles and marches in dead animals and general debris were seen all along the way. Having reached our bivouac near Boonesboro, our men and horses came to their rations and rest with a wonderful relish. During the day, we had been reading of the murderous riots made in northern cities, especially in New York, where men in mobs had ostensibly leagued against the authority of the government. The bloody accounts are stirring the rank and file of our army terribly. A feeling of intense indignation exists against traitorous demagogues, who are undoubtedly at the bottom of all this anarchy. 
detachments from many of the old regiments are now being sent north to look after northern traders this depletion of our ranks we cannot well afford for every available man is needed in the field many of our regiments are much reduced the harris light now musters but one hundred men fit for duty scarcely one-tenth the number with which we entered upon the campaign our horses are also much used up hundreds of them have been killed and wounded in battle and not a few have played out so that they are utterly unserviceable the author of these records has worn out completely two horses since he had a second horse shot under him in the cavalry fight near upperville july sixteenth boots and saddles sounded at four o'clock and before daylight we were on our way toward harper's ferry we revisited roresville crossed crampton's gap and at last reached the potomac at berlin where the division was separated a portion of it moving to harper's ferry where they bivouacked at night in the yard of the destroyed united states arsenal pontoons at harper's ferry in berlin were used for crossing the army into virginia the crossing was being effected as rapidly as possible yet for so vast an army it is always slow and tedious our troops are daily crossing and advancing but all is otherwise quiet we are now receiving an issue of clothing which we greatly need our ranks are putting on a new revived appearance the first sergeants of the harris light received orders to finish their payrolls general lee is reported to be falling back to the rappahannock sunday july nineteenth our cavalry left harper's ferry at two o'clock p m crossed the river on pontoons at sandy hook and advanced into virginia monthly returns for june were made before our march commenced the weather is very warm and sultry on the twentieth we resumed our march at ten a m and advanced to leesburg where we fed our horses and rested in the decline of the day we marched to goose creek on whose grassy banks we bivouacked for the night the whole cavalry force is moving towards the rappahannock on the twenty first we advanced via gum springs and centerville to manassas junction the boys had had some gay times to-day after blackberries which we found in great abundance all along our line of march general gregg was compelled to dismount several men in the forenoon and ordered them to march on foot for the offence of leaving the ranks for berries without permission a command would soon be totally demoralized if such tendency to unsoldierly conduct were not checked and though at times discipline seems severe yet especially with us it is absolutely necessary july twenty two to-day we marched to the vicinity of gainesville we fell in with scott's nine hundred and we were marching across the old field of bull run among whom we found several old acquaintances we spent a very few interesting moments together july twenty three our commander was cheered to-day by the arrival of a large mail which brought a message to nearly every man during active campaigning as in the invasion of pennsylvania and maryland it is difficult to keep up postal connections with the civil world and with the very best efforts which can be made our mails are greatly delayed sometimes even for weeks together but when they do come they are hailed with a delight which is almost frantic the post-boys are cheered as far as they can be seen as they wend their way from camp to camp with their horses loaded down with the enormously swollen mail-bags several bushels of letters are sometimes brought by one carrier as was the case to-day fighting at manassas gap during the day we have heard very heavy cannonading in the direction of white plains it appears that general meade misled by the information brought by some of his scouts expected to engage the rebel army in manassas gap or west of that where general buford found the enemy in force our army was accordingly concentrated upon this point the third corps under general french which occupied ashby's gap was sent forward rapidly to buford's support where its first division commanded by general hobart ward pushed through the gap driving the enemy before it but with mutual loss here the new york excelsior brigade general f b spinola commanding greatly distinguished itself by making three heroic charges up the frowning steeps where the rebels were strongly posted their general was twice wounded but the effort was a success on the morning of the twenty fourth our soldiers pushed forward as far as front royal but found no enemy 
then they learned that they had been fighting only a portion of lee's rear guard which in the night had slipped away in the trail of their main army southward by this move general meade's army lost about two days march and when again we reached the banks of the rappahannock the old foe was facing us in threatening attitude from the opposite shore this afternoon the harris light was sent on a scout to thoroughfare gap from the heights beyond the gap we saw the wagon train of the eleventh corps moving towards warrenton this was a portion of the force which had expected a fight at manassas gap july twenty five our cavalry force reached the vicinity of warrenton junction when we went into bivouac the second squadron of our regiment under captain o j downing moved to thoroughfare gap and returned to gainesville where it joined the regiment and then marched with us to the junction via bristol and callet before night we were sent out on picket in the vicinity of callet station where we relieved the first virginia cavalry we continued on picket through the twenty sixth but all was quiet along the lines an inspection of horses was made this morning when a large number were condemned as utterly unserviceable and they were started off towards washington to be exchanged for better ones july twenty seven i have the responsibility and honor of being in command of a company this afternoon a detachment of our forces was sent out on a sort of bushwhacking expedition a portion of company f was captured by the fourth virginia cavalry while patrolling the road near bristersburg we are not doing much these days except picketing scouting recruiting resting on the twenty ninth our entire brigade was marched to within three miles of warrenton and then countermarched to the old camp and on the last day of the month we advanced to warrenton in heavy force where general meade had had his headquarters for several days august one to-day general meade moved his headquarters to rappahannock station the heat is excessive two men of the harris light were sunstruck during the day we left warrenton at seven o'clock a m and moved very slowly all night we bivouacked not far from new baltimore on the following day we were sent out on picket which here is neither difficult nor dangerous our colonel otto harhouse is ill and is awaiting his documents for leave of absence from the regiment august three the colonel received his papers to-day and started forthwith for new york captain l h southard the senior officer is in command the regiment was sent to thoroughfare gap where we encamped in an apple orchard our infantry lines now extended down the rappahannock as far as fredericksburg which we hold the cavalry is picketing and patrolling all this territory however as there are so many regiments to engage in this work the duty is comparatively light many hands make light work sunday august nine we still continue near thoroughfare gap occasionally as our turn comes we picket along the manassas gap railroad major e f cook who has been absent for some time returned to us to-day and took command my old company e shows the following report present thirty two fit for duty twenty two on monday the regiment left camp at nine a m and separating into several detachments moved upon white plains and middleburg from different directions these places have been occupied for some time by mosby's guerrilla bands we did not succeed however in bringing them into an engagement as they were sharply on the lookout and studiously kept beyond the reach of our carbines occasionally our pickets are attacked by them and some lively times are experienced august thirteen i was detailed by the adjunct this morning to act as a sergeant major in place of sergeant temple who is assigned to the command of a company very few commissioned officers are with the regiment at present this leaves the command of several companies to enlisted men some of our officers are out on detached service while not a few during the lull of army operations have asked and received leaves of absence and are visiting their friends in the north it might indeed be said that we are all rusticating and were it not for the guerrilla bands that infest the country attacking our outpost and frequently disturbing our lines of communication with our bases of supply as well as the outer world our condition would be one of pleasing rest on the fourteenth a little excitement was afforded us to relieve us from the monotonous life which we are spending 
a detachment of the regiment commanded by captain greggs made a bold dash upon an ill-starred portion of mosby's band near aldi where we captured three men and twenty horses and equipment most of which had formerly belonged to our service having been taken by these wily guerrillas nearly every horse had the familiar u s upon his shoulder and the saddles with very few exceptions were of northern manufacture august fifteen the harris light moved from thoroughfare gap at ten a m we reached hartward church at eight in the evening via new baltimore and greenwich a considerable halt was made at warrenton junction where we drew rations and forage henry e davies jr just promoted to the colonelcy of the regiment joined us at the junction and took command he is immensely popular with the men especially those who admire bravery and heroism and who covet to be thoroughly drilled and disciplined august seventeen we continue at hartwood church with our camp located very near general kilpatrick's headquarters during the day colonel davies appointed me second lieutenant and assigned me to the command of company m as both the captain and first lieutenant of the company were absent on detached service late in the evening i received orders to report with my company at an early hour next day to captain meade division quartermaster at five o'clock on the morning of the eighteenth we made our bow to the captain who dispatched us as an escort or guard to a train from hartward to warrenton junction during the march we made an exciting dash upon a band of guerrillas who were watching for us expecting to make some captures but they were disappointed for we were not only prepared to resist them but would have captured them but for the superior fleetness of their horses after accomplishing the work we were sent out to do and resting one night we returned to the regiment august twenty two this is my natal day i find myself twenty-two years of age i am not surrounded on this anniversary as in former years by friends of my childhood but memories of the past come trooping up in such vivid lines as to make the day one of deep interest august twenty eighth my company which forms a part of captain mitchell's battalion is doing picket duty at present with the battalion on the rappahannock between banks and united states fords my company is at the captain's headquarters and acts as grand guard sunday august thirty to-day i accompanied the division and brigade officers of the day in their visit to and inspection of the pickets along the rappahannock our ride was very pleasant captain baker of the fifth new york cavalry dined with captain mitchell and myself he is a lively companion was in the hands of mosby last spring and has a fund of amusing and interesting incidents of army life with which to enliven his conversation on the last day of august captain mitchell was ordered to report to the regiment at hartwood church with his reserves the pickets are to remain on the river until attacked by the enemy or recalled by orders from division headquarters end of chapter fourteen part one chapter fourteen of three years in the federal cavalry part two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. Chapter 14, Part 2. Cavalry Gunboat Expedition. September 4. To break the monotony of picketing and to subserve the cause of freedom a most novel scheme was lately undertaken known as kilpatrick's gunboat expedition the object was to destroy a portion of the rebel navy anchored in the rappahannock near port conway opposite port royal this peculiar kind of warfare which required genius and dash was waged by the troopers with complete success and they returned to their bivouac fires to enliven the weary hours with stories of their long march down the river and their destructive charge upon the gunboats of the enemy the expedition set out about two o'clock on the morning of september first dr lucius p woods surgeon-in-chief of the first brigade third division gave the following interesting description of the above raid in a letter to mrs woods Quote, i returned yesterday after a three days expedition after gunboats we all laughed at the order sending cavalry after such craft but i am happy to say that the object of the expedition was accomplished 
we left camp at two o'clock a m marched all day and all the following night till three o'clock next morning when we made a furious charge upon rebel infantry they ran so fast as to disarrange the general's plan of attack the morning was so dark that we could not see one rod in advance we captured twelve or fifteen prisoners and general kilpatrick gave orders in their hearing to have the whole command fall back stating that the gunboats would be alarmed and the expedition be a failure the general took particular pains to allow half the prisoners to escape and to get across the rappahannock after falling back two miles we were countermarched toward the river near which we were formed in line of battle we sat there on our horses waiting for daylight then the flying artillery of ten guns supported by the old fifth new york and first of michigan dashed at a full run down to the river bank wheeled into position and gave the rebels a small cargo of hissing cast iron which waked them up more effectually than their ordinary morning call they soon came to their senses and for half an hour sent over to us what i should think to be by the noise they made tea kettles cooking stoves large cast iron hats etc but our smaller and more active guns soon silenced theirs and drove the gunners away when we turned our attention to the boring of holes in their boats with conical pieces of iron vulgarly called solid shot i am sure i can recommend them as first-class augers for they sank the boats in time for all hands to sit down to breakfast at half-past nine o'clock the repast consisted of muddy water rusty salt pork and half a hard cracker termed by us an ironclad breakfast we were absent from camp three days and had only nine hours sleep unquote. further interesting particulars were given in a new york daily as follows quote, the expedition under general kilpatrick set out a few days since to recapture in conjunction with the navy the gunboat satellite and reliance which recently fell into the hands of the rebels was so far as the cavalry is concerned successful on tuesday evening general kilpatrick arrived on this side of the river at port conway and brilliantly dashed upon the enemy's pickets under colonel low the rebels did not even make a show of resistance but rushed into a number of flatboats in the wildest confusion and landed safely on the opposite bank if they had made a show of fight they would have most likely been captured after the escape of the enemy general kilpatrick waited two hours for the cooperation of the navy which is understood to have been agreed upon the vessels did not arrive and general kilpatrick ordered a battery to open fire upon the gunboats reliance and seattle this was done at a distance of six hundred and fifty yards the enemy immediately abandoned the gunboats very fortunately for themselves for only a few moments elapsed before the satellite was in a sinking condition and the reliance rendered useless both boats were completely riddled by shot and shell the force under kilpatrick consisted of cavalry and two batteries of artillery the satellite is sunk and the reliance is so completely disabled as to be beyond hope of being repaired by the rebels unquote. on our return from port conway we passed through falmouth where we halted a short time it was pleasant to survey the scenes of former labors and conflicts much alarm appears to have been created among the rebels by our gunboat disturbance a large force of rebel cavalry can be distinctly seen approaching fredericksburg on the telegraph road and more or less commotion prevails across the river from falmouth we marched directly to hartford church on arriving here captain mitchell's battalion was ordered back to its old position on picket to relieve the infantry which took our places before the expedition to port conroy september five we continue our picket near united states ford this morning the regiment was mustered in for pay by major mcirvin who is temporarily in command colonel davies having been placed in command of a brigade at ten o'clock a m i received my commission of second lieutenant it was brought from the headquarters of the regiment by the bugler of company h it dates back to the cavalry fight at aldi which occurred on the seventeenth of june on this line of pickets we have continued uninterruptedly for a week on the seventh colonel davies with his assistant adjunct general visited our post it was very gratifying to captain mitchell and myself to receive the colonel's compliments for promptness and vigilance in our work 
especially as he has the reputation of never bestowing praise where it is not deserved i rode down to lieutenant temple's picket reserve at richard's ferry on the eighth i found the lieutenant in excellent humor but decidedly opposed to picketing as a permanent occupation we were however consoled with the hope of relief ere long in the afternoon the brigade officer of the day called at the bivouac of the grand guard and expressed himself as being highly pleased with the disposition and management of the pickets the enemy's pickets confront ours at all the fords of the river and appear in heavy force for some time we have understood that general lee's headquarters are at orange court house while his infantry occupies the south banks and bluffs of the rapidan stuart occupies culpeper court house and pickets and patrols the territory between the rapidan and the rappahannock a region shaped much like an old-fashioned harrow september thirteenth an advance of the union army was ordered yesterday by its chief in which the cavalry was to take a prominent part orders were issued accordingly last evening and every needed preparation made for our work at an early hour this morning the entire cavalry corps was on the march in order that the enemy might not be prematurely warned of our design the several commands were ordered to make as little noise as possible consequently the bugle calls were dispensed with and commanders made use of their voices and in some instances the orders were conveyed from rank to rank in a whisper the three great divisions of the corps were to cross the river as follows gregg's at sulphur springs buford's at rappahannock bridge and kilpatrick's at kelly's ford brandy station number three at six o'clock the harris light plunged into the river at kelly's forge leading the advance a strong detachment of stuart's cavalry consisting of pickets and reserves opposed our crossing with dogged pertinacity but finally yielding to our superior numbers and to the deadly accuracy of our carbines gave way he then advanced in the direction of brandy station the farther we advanced the stronger grew the ever accumulating force of the enemy who disputed every inch of ground with great stubbornness on arriving near the station we found the enemy in strong force with artillery posted on the surrounding hills we saw clearly that a third cavalry fight was destined to be fought on this historic battlefield and we began to make preparations for the onset it was my fortune to lead the advance company in the first charge three men and four horses were killed and wounded in this company by the first discharge of the enemy's artillery whose fire was terribly accurate but we had not been fighting long before the other divisions joined us at their approach great enthusiasm among our boys prevailed before our combined force the enemy was swept up from those plains like chaff before the whirlwind they fled in the direction of culpepper a naturally strong and now fortified position where we knew we must soon encounter the rebel chivalry en masse upon their chosen field fight at culpepper courthouse from brandy station general pleasanton directed kilpatrick to make a detour via stevensburg in order to operate as a flanking column upon the enemy at the proper time with the first and second divisions pleasanton pushed straight on to culpepper driving the enemy before him without much resistance until within about a mile of the town here our advance was effectually checked a fearful duel now took place with varying fortunes for some time the enemy baffled all our efforts to dislodge him from his strong position and our men began to look wishfully for the flankers when lo kilpatrick's flags were seen advancing from the direction of stevensburg and his artillery was soon thundering in the enemy's flank and rear upon this unexpected and well-directed fire that portion of the enemy which had kept our main column at bay fell back in confusion into the town and before they had time to reform their broken lines the harris light fifth new york first vermont and first michigan led by general custer dashed upon the johnnies in the streets throwing the boast of the chivalry into perfect rout many prisoners were captured more or less material of war and three blakely guns the rebels retreated hastily in the direction of pony mountain and rapidan bridge whither they were closely pursued by our victorious squadrons the day following this brilliant advance pleasanton occupied all the fords of the rapidan extending his pickets on our right as far forward as the robinson and hazel rivers 
the way having been thus prepared by his heroic avant courier general meade advanced the army of the potomac across the rappahannock and took his temporary residence in culpeper september fifteen kilpatrick's division advanced from culpeper to raccoon ford on the rapidan colonel davies brigade supported a battery of artillery a short distance from the ford from one till four p m the shelling from the enemy's batteries was terrific their position was admirable on the high bluff south of the ford and the range was just right for execution their artillery was of a heavy caliber and supported by infantry they were finally secured by earthworks while our forces were almost entirely exposed and protected only here and there by a little knoll in the unequal duel which took place two of our guns were dismounted and disabled while several artillerymen and horses were killed it was not at all practical for us to attempt a crossing before night we retired from the ford and the divisions took up their headquarters gregg's at rappahannock bridge buford's at stevensburg and kilpatrick's on the extreme right at james city september sixteenth to-day we are picketing the fords of the robertson river a branch of the rapid at five o'clock p m the fifth new york pickets were attacked and driven to within a few rods of their reserve but being reinforced by ourselves who were ordered to relieve them the enemy was compelled to retire hastily and we reoccupied the line which was taken up by the fifth in the morning at ten o'clock in the night i received orders to take four men and communicate with major mcirvin at newman's ford two miles above our post on the robertson this was by no means an easy task as the wilderness country was almost wholly unknown to us and the rebel pickets in this quarter had not been sounded through the darkness however i advanced with my men as cautiously as possible and yet at several points along our line of march we drew the fire of the rebel pickets at length we espied a force of cavalry approaching us which proved to be a detachment under major mcirvin on the way to the ford we challenged one another simultaneously each supposing the other to be an enemy the major was on the point of ordering his command to fire upon me when i recognized his voice and quickly gave him my name the discovery was timely and mutually enjoyable september seventeenth the enemy advanced his picket lines this morning across the river pushed ours back with considerable precipitancy when a general skirmish occurred along the lines for a distance of about two miles captain hasty was chief in command of our skirmishers i assisted him riding my sorrel pony the only horse on the skirmish line as all the men fought dismounted at nine o'clock colonel davies arrived with his brigade and took command the rebels were not able to withstand our accumulated power and rapidly retreated across the river enabling us to re-establish our lines where they were before the onset picket firing is very common give and take is the game we play and sometimes the blows are as severe as they are unexpected the cavalry is almost constantly on duty scouting patrolling and very often fighting thus we are kept ever in motion the only relief from our excessive labors is our good living seldom are soldiers permitted to live in a country of which it may be said as emphatically as of this that it flows with milk and honey the numerous flocks of sheep and herds of cattle in the neighborhood are made to contribute the basis of our rations while the poultry-yard larders and orchards are made to yield the delicacies of the season the country abounds in sorghum apple butter milk honey sweet potatoes peaches apples etc so that kings are not much better fed than are the cavaliers of this command september nineteenth the weather is becoming cold and wet yesterday this brigade retired from the robertson to the vicinity of stevensburg where we bivouacked in the pine woods henry e davis jr formerly colonel of the harris light and for some time past in command of the first brigade of kilpatrick's division was congratulated today by his friends upon his promotion to brigadier general no promotion was ever more fitly made and the star never graced a more perfect gentleman or more gallant soldier the general feeling in the command is long may he live in the service of his country and for the honor of her flag sunday september twenty this morning very appropriate and solemn funeral services were held conducted by chaplain edward p rowe in honor of the officers and soldiers of the harris light who were killed in our recent advance too and skirmishes along the rapidan and robertson rivers important reconnaissance and raid on the morning of the twenty first at daybreak 
an important movement was commenced by generals kilpatrick and buford while general gregg remained on the picket lines the object of the advance was mainly to reconnoitre the position and strength of the enemy and at the same time to do all the mischief we could we made a forced march directly upon madison court house meeting but little opposition the tired troopers rested themselves and their animals at night preparatory to another early advance september twenty two we were early in the saddle with our steps turned southward in the direction of orange court house the two divisions advanced upon different but nearly parallel roads we had not proceeded far before messengers from general buford informed us that by a rapid movement across the country between the two roads kilpatrick might intercept a brigade of the enemy's cavalry which buford was engaging and pursuing the harris light had the advance of the division and we soon came in contact with the retreating rebel force in a dense oak forest through which we were compelled to approach the pike by a wood road which was so narrow as to necessitate our moving in columns of two upon gaining the main road we found the entire force of the enemy advancing with skirmishers deployed and a battery of light artillery in position which instantaneously opened up upon us with grape and canister the situation of our regiment was extremely critical and embarrassing engagement at liberty mills generals kilpatrick and davies were at the head of the column and by them we were ordered and encouraged to present a bold front and make a desperate resistance in order to give the division time to file out of the forest and get into fighting position along the road at this juncture i was in command of the first company of the first squadron and consequently was ordered to cross the pike and to check the advance of the enemy in that quarter while the balance of the regiment was to hold the pike in a small opening to the left we had barely time to deploy our skirmishers when the rebel commander seeing that his only hope of escape from the trap we were laying for him lay in a quick and decisive charge came down upon us like an avalanche crushing through the force that was on the road and sweeping a clear path for his escape the resistance of the regiment however was so desperate that the killed and wounded from both sides strewed the hotly contested ground in every direction not more than twenty minutes elapsed from the time we first saw the enemy before the contest was decided and yet in this brief period of time the harris light lost several of its most gallant officers and many of its bravest men our loss was principally in wounded and prisoners while that of the enemy was in killed and wounded by this sudden and unexpected charge of the enemy upon the force of the pike myself and company were completely cut off from our main column for one whole hour we were entirely enclosed within the lines of the rebel cavalry it is true that they had about all they could do to take care of themselves and yet they might have bagged and gobbled our small force but by swift and careful movements we succeeded in eluding the vigilance of the rebels and finally we made our exit from their lines unhurt and with much valuable information which we had obtained as soon as possible i reported to general kilpatrick who was much surprised at seeing me having come to the conclusion that myself and men were already on our way to richmond the forces of stuart were ultimately routed and fell back from liberty ford near which the fight occurred upon their infantry reserves at gordonsville my escape from the toils of the enemy was regarded as almost miraculous general davies sent an aide to me with his compliments inviting me to his headquarters where he expressed his surprise at my safe return and complimented me for the dexterity wisdom and success of my movement the day following this engagement and adventure our forces returned to the vicinity of culpeper where we spent a few days in comparative rest rest which we all needed and greatly enjoyed september twenty five i received an order this afternoon from major mcirvin commanding the regiment directing me to take command of company h which is without a commander on the twenty sixth the paymaster made his appearance among us much to the satisfaction of the command owing to the continuous movements of the cavalry corps and its generally exposed condition no opportunity had been afforded the government to pay us for the last six months very little money was in the regiment even officers as well as men being pretty well reduced the paymaster's stamps were more than usually acceptable september twenty eighth four companies namely b f h and m commanded by captain grinton were ordered on picket to-day along the hazel river one half of this force occupies the picket line the other half patrols the country 
the captain commands the post and i have the special charge of the pickets we do not want at present for fresh meat and vegetables we live almost entirely from the country and we live well our bill of fare is varied and rich forage for our horses is also abundant in all the neighboring plantations picketing under these circumstances is more like a picnic than anything else which we can remember october eighth we are still in statu quo picketing on the hazel river however yesterday captain mitchell relieved captain grinton in command of the post the reserve companies fell in line to hear the orders of the war department concerning veteran volunteers they produced quite an excitement among us the three years enlistment of a large portion of the army is nearly expired and the government in its anxiety to avail itself of the experience of the veteran troops to the end of the conflict is now offering extra inducements in the way of furloughs and bounties to secure the reenlistment of these men to the end of the war the orders propounded to us met with universal favor and the cry runs like wildfire from rank to rank let us go in boys this will be an element of great power a citizen youth of manly bearing who professes loyalty to our cause came to our pickets to-day and from thence to headquarters bringing information of a rebel plan to surprise our picket lines to-night we will give them a warm reception if they undertake the execution of their scheme a regiment of infantry and one squadron of cavalry arrive before dark and are in readiness for the night's entertainment the pickets are doubly strong and under special orders to be vigilant october ninth the enemy did not venture an attack last night but doubtless contented themselves with the maxim that quote, discretion is the better part of valor unquote. possibly they were informed of our preparations for them spies and informants are numerous and active on both sides lieutenant houston and privates donahue and pug were captured this morning while scouting just beyond the pickets much activity is manifested on our front indeed it is quite generally understood among us that general lee is taking the initiatory steps of a flank movement upon us our scouts so report and the suspicious movements of the pickets and forces before us corroborate the information End of chapter 14, part 2. Chapter 15 of Three Years in the Federal Cavalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Years in the Federal Cavalry by Willard Glazier. Chapter 15 capture of the author eighteen sixty three fight at james city music of retreat fourth cavalry fight at brandy station critical situation kilpatrick undaunted davies and custer the grand charge the escape the scene subsequent charges and counter charge the cavalry routed the rappahannock recrossed in safety Infantry reconnaissance to Brandy Station. Comical affair at Bagleton Station. Thrilling adventure at Stuart. His escape. Battle of Bristow. Casualties. Retreat continued. Destruction of railroad by the rebels. Kilpatrick at Buckland Mills. Unpleasant surroundings. Sagety and daring. The author's capture. Fall. Insensibility change of scene the end introduced to prison life early in the morning of october tenth the enemy in heavy force came down upon our pickets along the robertson river driving us back in haste and occupying the fords the flank movement of general lee was fully understood he had crossed the rapidan advanced to madison court house and was lapping around our right wing threatening it with destruction quick work on our part was now necessary swift messengers from officers high in command brought orders to retire with promptness but in good order if possible our boys in many instances were compelled to leave uneaten and even untasted their palatable preparations for breakfast of roast lamb sweet potatoes fine wheat bread milk and honey etc to attend to the stern and always unpleasant duties of a retreat with the enemy pressing very close upon us 
sharp skirmishing took place at the river and the successive crack of carbines afforded the music of our march to james city where the conflict deepened into a battle which raged with fury and slaughter the enemy conscious of having outgeneraled us in this instance and having at least a temporary advantage was bold and defiant he was met however with corresponding vigor those contesting legions which had so often measured sabres in the fearful charge and hand-to-hand -hand encounter again appealed to the god of battle and wrestled with herculean strength for the mastery night came on at length to hush the strife and the weary men and horses sought repose from the bloody fray october eleventh with the first pencilings of the morning light we took up our line of march towards the rappahannock skirmishing continued nearly every step of the way on the sparrowville pike to culpepper we were closely pursued and heavily pressed at culpepper the corps separated greg who had come by way of cedar mountain passed out on the road to sulphur spring buford moved in the direction of stevensburg leaving kilpatrick alone on the main thoroughfare along the railroad line kilpatrick accompanied by pleasanton had scarcely left culpepper when hampton's legions made a furious attack upon his rear guard with the hope of breaking through upon the main column to scatter it or of so retarding its progress that a flanking column might fall upon him ere he could reach the safe shore of the rappahannock our infantry which yesterday occupied this ground had retired leaving the cavalry to struggle out of the toils of the enemy as best as it could gallantly repelling every attack of the enemy our command moved on without expending much of its time and material until opposite the residences of hon john minor botts where a few regiments suddenly wheeled about and facing the pursuing foe charged upon them with pistols and sabres giving them a severe check and an unexpected repulse on arriving at brandy station kilpatrick found himself in a most critical situation with an accumulation of formidable difficulties on every hand which threatened his annihilation buford who had been sharply pursued by fitzhugh lee's division over the plains of stevensburg had retired more rapidly than kilpatrick and unaware of his commander's danger had suffered lee to plant his batteries on the high hills which commanded kirkpatrick's right while the rebel troopers in three heavy lines of battle held the only route by which kilpatrick could retreat lee's sharpshooters also occupied the woods in the immediate vicinity of kilpatrick's columns where they were making themselves a source of damage and great annoyance to increase the danger of the situation stuart by hard marching had swung around to kilpatrick's left and had taken possession of a range of hills planted batteries and was preparing to charge down upon the surrounded division below this was a situation to try the stoutest hearts nothing daunted however by this terrific array of the enemy kilpatrick displayed that decision and daring which has ever characterized him as a great cavalry leader and he proved himself worthy of the brave men who compose his command his preparation for the grand charge was soon completed forming his division into three lines of battle he assigned the right to davies the left to custard and placing himself with pleasanton in the centre he advanced with unwavering determination to the contest having approached to within a few yards of the enemy's line on his front he ordered his band to strike up a national air to whose spirit-stirring strains was joined the blast of scores of bugles ringing forth the charge with his usual daring davis was foremost in the fray leading his command for the fourth time on this memorable field to his men he had addressed these stirring words soldiers of the first brigade i know you have not forgotten the example of your brave comrades who in past engagements here were not afraid to die in defence of the old flag custer the daring terrible demon that he is in battle pulled off his cap and handed it to his orderly then dashed madly forward in the charge while his yellow locks floated like pennants on the breeze pennington and elder handled their batteries with great agility and success at times opening huge gaps in the serried lines of the enemy fired to an almost divine potency and with a majestic madness this band of heroic troopers shook the air with their battle-cry and dashed forward to meet the hitherto exultant foe 
ambulances forges and cannons with pack horses and mules non-combatants and others all joined to swell the mighty tide brave hearts grew braver and faltering ones waxed warmer and stronger until pride of country had touched this raging sea of thought and emotion kindling an unconquerable principle which emphatically affirmed every man a hero unto death so swiftly swept forward this tide of animated power that the rebel lines broke in wild dismay before the uplifted and firmly grasped sabres of these unflinching veterans who feeling that life and country were at stake risked them both upon the fearful issue kilpatrick thus escaped disaster defeated his pursuers captured several pieces of the enemy's artillery and presented to the beholders one of the grandest scenes ever witnessed in the new world by heaven it was a splendid sight to see for one who had no friend or brother there no one who looked upon that wonderful panorama can ever forget it on the great field were riderless horses and dying men clouds of dust from solid shot and bursting shell occasionally obscured the sky broken caissons and upturned ambulances obstructed the way while long lines of cavalry were pressing forward in the charge with their drawn sabres glistening in the bright sunlight far beyond the scene of tumble were the quiet dark green forests which skirt the banks of the rappahannock the poet harvard in his schaudenberg has well described the scene hark the death-denouncing trumpets sound the fatal charge and shouts proclaim the onset destruction rushes dreadful to the field and bathes itself in blood havoc let loose now undistinguished rages all around while ruin seated on her dreary throne sees the plain strewn with subjects truly hers breathless and cold the rebel cavalry undoubtedly ashamed of their own conduct and defeat reorganized their broken ranks and again advanced upon kilpatrick and buford whose divisions had united to repel the attack for at least two long hours of slaughter these opposing squadrons dashed upon one another over these historic fields charges and counter charges followed in quick succession and at times the gray and the blue were so confusedly commingled together that it was difficult to conjecture how they could regain their appropriate places quite a number of prisoners were made on both sides it was a scene of wild commotion and blood this carnival continued until late at night when the exhausted and beaten foe sank back upon safer grounds to rest while our victorious braves crowned with undying laurels gathered up their wounded and dead companions and unmolested recrossed the rappahannock october twelfth to-day a portion of our infantry was thrown across the rappahannock they advanced by a forced march to reconnoiter as far as brandy station where they met the enemy in force and engaged him in a sharp contest they returned however without serious loss our main army is retreating toward washington on the evening of the thirteenth while bivouacking near bealton station a serial comical scene diverted for a time the attention of our officers and men by a strange accident an ammunition wagon took fire which caused the rapid explosion of its contents shells flew and burst in every direction and the apparent musketry was terrible the consequence was a widespread alarm which brought every trooper to his horse ready to engage the foe who was supposed to have made a furious onset great merriment and relished rest followed the discovery of the cause of the disturbance especially as no one was seriously hurt since our last reconnaissance to brandy station stuart had been very active following our rear very closely and committing all the depredations possible in his hands have fallen many stragglers who it is true were of very little use to us but who would count as well and true men in the rebel lists exchanges of our prisoners some of stuart's performances were exceedingly hazardous as the following well-described narrative from a well-known pen will clearly show Quote, stuart with two thousand of his cavalry pressed our rear so eagerly that when near calette's station he had inadvertently got ahead by a flank movement of our second corps general warren acting as a rear guard and was hemmed in where his whole command must have been destroyed or captured had he not succeeded in hiding in a thicket of old field pines close by the road whereon our men marched by 
the rear of the corps encamping close beside the enemy utterly unsuspicious of their neighborhood though every word uttered in our lines as they passed was distinctly heard by the lurking foe stuart at first resolved to abandon his guns and attempted to escape with moderate loss but finally picked three of his men and gave them muskets made them up so as to look as much as possible like our soldiers and thus dropped silently into our ranks as they passed march a while then slip out on the other side of the column and make all haste to general lee at warrington in quest of help during the night two of our officers who stepped into the thicket were quietly captured at daylight the crack of skirmishers muskets in the distance gave token that lee had received and responded to the prayer for help when stuart promptly opened with grape and canister on the rear of our astounded column which had bivouacked just in his front throwing it into such confusion that he easily dashed by and rejoined his chief having inflicted some loss and suffered little or none battle of bristow the above manoeuvres were a great and unexpected or unsought risk which however did not prove disastrous to the authors but which might not again be ventured with similar results a performance resembling it somewhat was enacted by the rebels but with very different issue early in the morning of the fourteenth a p hill's corps left warrington with orders to strike our rear at bristow station they moved up the alexandria turnpike to broad run church where they deflected on the road to greenwich and soon after struck our trail just behind the third corps and eagerly pursued it they were busy picking up stragglers and making some preparations for an attack upon our unsuspecting corps when about noon general warren's second corps which was still behind and bringing up the rear made its appearance on the tapis and materially changed the program of the scene hill finding himself nicely sandwiched or trapped by his own indiscretion turned away from the retreating third corps to fight and if possible drive back the advancing sect warren's surprise in finding an enemy in force before him was not less than hill's in finding one behind him but it took warren only about ten minutes to adjust himself to this unexpected position of affairs when his batteries opened with such precision and effect aided by the musketry of his infantry that the rebels fell back in much greater haste than they had advanced leaving six of their guns in our hands and multitudes of dead wounded and prisoners five of the captured guns still serviceable were at once seized and used against the disappointed foe with telling power one historian says our loss in killed and wounded was about two hundred including colonel james e mallon forty-second new york killed and general tile of pennsylvania wounded that of the enemy was probably four hundred besides prisoners including generals posey mortally kirkland and cook wounded and colonels ruffin first north carolina and thompson fifth north carolina cavalry killed this bristow fiasco was a stunning blow to the rebel pursuit and greatly checked their incursions but our soldiers held the field so lately won only until dark and then followed the rest of the army whose retreat they had so effectually covered general meade continued his retreat to centerville and then seemingly ashamed as well he might be of his flight would have retraced his steps and pushed back the insolent foe but he was prevented from executing his plans by a heavy rainstorm which began on the sixteenth while he was awaiting the arrival of pontoons to enable him to recross bull run which was enormously swollen the enemy after some daring skirmishes along his front and some feints of attack retreated quite rapidly completely destroying the orange and alexandria railroad from manassas junction to the rappahannock a more thorough work of destruction was never witnessed scarcely a tie even remained ties were generally heaped together and set on fire and the rails were laid upon the heaps crosswise as the middle of the rails became heated the ends looped down forming a graceful bow they were thus effectually ruined in many instances the rails thus heated were twisted around the trees the roads and the telegraph lines and posts were utterly demolished for a few days the harris light was bivouacking near sudley church and the cavalry was picketing scouting and patrolling on either side of bull run and on one occasion while endeavoring to ford the swollen stream several men and horses were drowned october eighteenth 
Today Kilpatrick advanced with his division, which consists of Custer's and Davies' brigade, to within half a mile of Gainesville, where we bivouacked for the night. A terrific rainstorm raged nearly all night, making our condition very uncomfortable and rendering the going impractical, except upon the turnpikes. At this time of the year, these night storms in Virginia are very cold, and the sufferings of men, mostly unsheltered as we were, are beyond description. On such a night, one will naturally recall such a passage as the following, from Byron's Child Herald. Quote, the sky is changed, and such a change, O oh, night, and storm, and darkness, ye are wondrous strong, yet lovely in your strength, as is the light of a dark eye in a woman. Far, along from peak to peak, the rattling crags among, leaps the live thunder, not from one lone cloud, but every mountain now hath found a tongue, and Jura answers through her misty shroud back to the joyous Alps, who call to her aloud, and this is in the night, most glorious night, thou wert not sent for slumber. Let me be a sharer in thy fierce and far delight, a portion of the tempest and of thee. Unquote. It is true that the poet, looking out upon the storm and listening to its mutterings from his comfortable studio, may call such a night glorious, and may find in it depths of inspiration and delight. But to us poor soldiers, it seemed more appropriate to take up Shakespeare's lines. Quote, the tyranny of the open nights too rough for nature to endure, while every one felt to say, Gathering clouds, like meeting armies, come on apace, Lee's Mithridates. All night long our pickets along Cedar Run were confronted by Stuart's pickets, though no disposition to fight us was manifested in the morning. Dripping with wet and somewhat stiffened with cold, we were ordered in battle array early in the morning, and the command, about 2,000 strong, advanced towards Buckland Mills. The rebel pickets were quickly withdrawn, and their whole force slowly and without resistance retired before us. With some degree of hesitation, yet unconscious of imminent danger, we advanced on the main turnpike towards Warrenton. Our advance brigade had just passed New Baltimore when Fitzhugh Lee, who had surprised and cut his way through a small detachment of our infantry at Thoroughfare Gap, then had swiftly swung around our right by an unpicketed road, fell upon our rear guard at Buckland Mills, and opened upon our unsuspecting column with a battery of flying artillery. At this signal, Stuart, who had hitherto retired before us quietly, now turned about and advanced upon us in front with terrible determination. Thus, unexpected troubles were multiplying around us. Scarcely had we time to recover our senses from the first shock of attack upon our rear and front, when General Gordon, with a division of infantry until now concealed behind a low range of hills and woods on our left, appeared upon the scene, and advanced upon our flank with a furious attack which threatened to sever our two small brigades and to annihilate the entire command. We were now completely surrounded by a force which outnumbered us at least four to one. This was a critical situation, but Kill, as the general is familiarly styled among us, seemed to comprehend it in a moment. All thought and effort now centralized in a plan of escape from these snares which the enemy had laid for us, and into which we had too easily thrown ourselves. Kilpatrick is supposed by some to have unnecessarily exposed himself, in which he suffered his first defeat, though escaping with a remarkably small loss quickly ordering his force to wheel about he led them back in a determined charge upon lee's column and artillery now planted on the banks along cedar run this timely order executed with masterly skill saved his command from utter disaster and justified his course as it was however he lost nearly three hundred men including quite a number who were drowned in the creek while endeavoring to escape the scene was one of great confusion and distress the author's capture by the sudden evolution of the command, when the order was first executed, the Harris Light, which was in front, while advancing, was thrown in the rear, and was thus compelled to meet the desperate charges of the enemy in pursuit, and to defend itself as best it could from fire on the flank. Having reached a slight elevation of ground in the road, we made a stand, and for some time checked the advancing columns of the rebels by pouring into their ranks rapid and deadly volleys from our carbines and revolvers. 
Stuart, who commanded in person, saw clearly that the quickest and almost only way to dislodge us was by charging upon us, and consequently ordering the charge he came with a whole brigade amid deafening yells. Our men stood firmly, almost like rocks before the surging sea. We were soon engaged in a fierce hand-to-hand -hand conflict with the advancing columns. In Byron's Corsair, we find a description of the scene. Quote, Within a narrow ring compressed, beset, hopeless, not heartless, strive and struggle yet. Ha! Ah, now they fight in firmest file no more, hemmed in, cut off, cleft down, and trampled o'er. But each strikes singly, silently, at home, and sinks outwearied rather than o'ercome, his last faint quittance rendering with his breath till the blade glimmers in the grasp of death. Unquote. At this important juncture, my faithful horse was shot under me, and we both fell to the ground. Meanwhile, our little party, outnumbered ten to one, was hurled back by the overpowering shock of the rebels, who rode directly over me. Injured somewhat by the falling of my horse, and nearly killed by the charging squadrons, which one after the other trod upon me, I lay in the mud, for some time quite insensible. How long I lay there I cannot tell, but when I returned to consciousness the scene had changed. I was in the hands of a rebel guard, who were carrying me hastily from the hard-fought field. My arms had been taken from me, and my pockets rifled of all their valuables, including my watch. I was unceremoniously borne to the vicinity of an old building, where I met a number of my comrades, who with me had shared the misfortunes of the day and thus ended three years and more of camping and campaigning with the harris light what i saw and endured thought and experienced during a little more than a year among the rebels in several of their loathsome prisons may be found recorded in a volume i published in eighteen sixty five entitled the capture prison pen and escape Fini. end of chapter fifteen end of three years in the federal cavalry by willard glazier